Hi, everybody. Um, so my name, as she said, is Crystal Kaufman. I'm a nurse practitioner over at Spring Valley Hospital, which is on the uh, southwest side of town. Um, I am the neuroscience program director over there. So I am over the, um, um, the stroke program, as well as um, I see patients in the ICU with neuro issues, things like that. Right, can everybody hear me OK? Usually my voice carries fairly well, so I don't have too much trouble with it. So today we're going to be talking about stroke, okay? Things that everyone needs to know about stroke, because stroke can affect anybody at any time and affects a lot of people. Right now, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in this country, which is a good thing because it used to be third. So in the last couple of years, we've made significant improvements and more people are surviving with their strokes. The problem is, is that we are still the leading cause of disability, okay? Right now, 795,000 Americans will suffer a stroke every year. That's a lot of people, okay? Of those, 185,000 are recurrent strokes. That number really bothers me because that tells me that those who have had a stroke are having another stroke. So either we did not treat you properly or we did not educate you well enough to understand to take the medicines you need to take to prevent another stroke. So that bothers me personally as a healthcare provider in stroke. On average, that's one stroke every 40 seconds. So that's a little over a stroke a minute. That's a lot. Okay. 130,000 deaths per year are strictly attributable to stroke, which is one in 20 deaths. So again, we're the fifth leading cause of death. We're getting better. More people are surviving. In this country, every year we spend about $34 billion in stroke-related care costs and loss of work. Every year, $34 billion just treating stroke and taking care of people who have had strokes. Imagine what we could do with that money. So why does it matter? Stroke is the number one leading cause of disability. I think it's awful that people die from stroke. I think it's really bad people become disabled from stroke, especially when we can treat it and prevent it. When we look at stroke survivors over the age of 65, so 65 and older, came in, had a stroke. At six months out, one half of them still had hemiparesis, which means weakness or loss of function on one side of the body. 30%, that's, that's, that's a lot. 30% needed help with walking, okay? 46% had cognitive deficits, something thinking-wise isn't working normally. Is, is that for the rest of their lives? Or is it for the, at six months. Oh. At six months. 20% had trouble speaking. One-third, 35% had some symptoms of depression. And one-quarter were dependent in their daily living, meaning they needed help dressing, showering, eating, whatever. One-quarter. One quarter were in nursing facilities. I don't like this number. So one in four at 65 or older who have a stroke are gonna end up in a nursing facility. We can do better, okay? But I need your help to accomplish that, okay? So let's talk about what is a stroke, okay? There's several different types of strokes, so you need to understand what they are. A stroke in general, above and beyond no matter what else is going on, is a sudden death of brain cells in an area due to inadequate blood flow. Something has caused the blood not to flow and brain cells are dying, okay? The main kinds are ischemic, hemorrhagic, lacunar, and then cryptogenic, and we're gonna talk about those. Ischemic uh, stroke, that means a clot. Some kind of clot or dam has formed in the vessel, okay? 
You can have a thrombotic clot, which means that the clot formed in the vessel itself. This most commonly is from atherosclerosis, okay? Or plaque building up in the vessel, okay? So this is like your high cholesterol issues. You guys are probably familiar with coronary artery disease, right? Where the vessels in your heart build up plaque or fat and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and clots it off and that's when you get a heart attack, okay? Same thing, only this is in the head. So that's a thrombotic stroke. An embolic stroke is where you form a clot somewhere else and send it to the vessel in the head. Most commonly, these are heart issues. So people with uh, atrial fibrillation, for instance, AFib, you form clots in the heart and one breaks off and goes to the head. That can cause a stroke. That's an embolic stroke. If you have blockages in the uh, carotid arteries, and a piece breaks off and goes into your head and causes a stroke. That's a embolic stroke. Make sense? Okay. Then we have lacunar strokes. Now, lacunar strokes, to be honest with you, if you're gonna have one, this is the one you want, okay? <laughs> but I would prefer you not have any strokes, so let's aim for that, okay? Lacunar infarcts are very small, deep tissue strokes. Most of the time, you may not even know you've had one. Okay? The biggest risk factor with the lacunar stroke is high blood pressure. In our brain, the vessels twist and turn, and sometimes they make 90 degree turns. When your blood pressure is high, that irritates the vessels, the blood vessels. So when they get irritated from that high blood pressure, sometimes they'll seal off in those very small vessels when they're making that turn. Again, a 90 degree turn in a blood vessel is very tight. So you make it mad with high blood pressure and it's gonna seal off. So you end up with a stroke like this. Now again, most of the time, see right here, this is damaged dead brain. Lacunar stroke. On a CT scan, it'll show up something like this. Okay. Most of the time you may have symptoms that kind of little bit and then go away. And then we image you and we're like, oh, look, you had a stroke. You may never have even known that that had happened. You may come in for some other issue and we go, oh, look, you had a stroke. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor and you get your EKG done and they go, oh, look, you've had a heart attack and you didn't know it. Then we have the cryptogenic strokes. Cryptogenic is a big fancy medical term that means I don't know. These are people who have strokes and we can't figure out why you had it. So not having a blood pressure problem, doesn't look like you got any clots in your heart, we can't find any clots in your vessels. You just decided to have a stroke today. So we do the best we can and um, treat you for pretty much everything. Because <laughs> we're like, I don't know. So we say, oh, you've had a cryptogenic stroke. So we don't sound so silly going, I don't know. Can you see it in a brain Oh yeah, we see the stroke on the imaging. We just don't know why it occurred. So we know you had a stroke. We just don't know why, okay? Now to be honest with you, most likely, as we research this better and do a better job of diagnosing it, most of these are probably going to end up being embolic, primarily heart. We think a lot more people have AFib than we know about. Some people have what we call paroxysmal AFib, means that they're in AFib and then in normal sinus rhythm, then in AFib, then in normal rhythm. And that's actually more dangerous than being in AFib all the time. Because when you're in AFib, your atrium quiver and you form clots. When your atrium decide to beat, here go the clots, okay? So the only way we know you're in AFib is when we put you on the monitor and we see it, okay? So one of the things that's coming out of this that you may see in the future 
is that people who have been diagnosed with a stroke and we're not sure why you had it, you may end up on long-term cardiac monitoring to look for AFib. Some of the studies they've done have actually found paroxysmal AFib as much as three months out from the stroke. So it's one of those things that we're looking at to possibly change treatments going forward. In uh, AFib, can that go away? Or um, do you always have it for the rest of your life? Well, see, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, in heart world, oftentimes they'll treat you for a while for AFib, but they'll go, hey, look, you've been in sinus rhythm for two years. We can take you off the anticoagulants. In my world, in stroke world, I'm like, oh, no, 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 because you could pop back into AFib at any time, and that's when you're going to have a stroke, because I see it. So it depends on who you ask. And right now, we're not sure. But what if you have a hemorrhagic stroke and AFib? Well, see, that's another problem, because if you bleed, we have to take you off the anticoagulants and hope you don't have a stroke. What is the fib? Atrial fibrillation, it's where your atrium and your heart, the top two chambers, so you have an atrium and then you have ventricles. The little atrium quiver. When the big ventricles quiver, that's called V-fib, you die, okay? But AFib, you can live with, okay? I'll give you an example, my dad went into AFib, it's been almost three years ago, randomly, out of nowhere, had no idea, no history of it. He self-converted back to normal sinus rhythm and for two and a half years was fine. In March, he felt like crap. I'm like, hmm, that's not good. Crap, you're in AFib again. Thankfully, he's been on Xeralto this whole time. Not that I'm promoting one drug over another, but he happens to be on Xeralto. So when they cardioverted him, he had no clots in his heart because they check before they cardiovert you. So, but again, He's on a blood thinner, so he's at risk for bleeding. It's a risk benefit decision. Okay? So, moving on to hemorrhagic. So, we've talked about ischemic. That accounts for about 87% of strokes. Okay? Your hemorrhagics are the other 13%. Basically, that is a bleeding stroke. Okay? So, instead of having a clot, and loss of oxygen, you have blood in the brain. Blood cells, brain cells do not play well together in the sandbox. They do not like each other, okay? Blood kills brain every time. So wherever the blood touches, the brain dies, okay? That's why they're kept separate with a blood-brain barrier. So when you have a blood in the head like this, it's not gonna show up, see that clot? That's a bleed, okay? You're going to have significant problems. There are different reasons why you bleed. The most common is high blood pressure. So your pressure spikes, the vessel wall is weak, it breaks open and you bleed. A small percentage of bleeds are caused by aneurysms. So that's a bulging or weakness in the wall of the vessel and it ruptures and you bleed, okay? but most of them are high blood pressure. Yeah, what's, what's the cure for the Give me a minute. Okay. You also have something called a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack. This means you have the symptoms of a stroke, but you don't have radiographic evidence of damage. This is your one chance, your big flashing red light danger ahead go get checked out, okay? TIAs usually last less than 20 minutes. This is not something to ignore. This is your one chance to get on top of whatever your risk factors are because most people will go on about a third to have a massive stroke within a year of a TIA. What do you feel like when you're having a TIA? The TIAs are the same symptoms of our, that you would have for a stroke, and we're going to talk about those in just a minute, okay? So it is identical to a stroke. The thing is, it goes away. Here's my advice to you. Come on into the hospital anyway, okay? Let us evaluate and treat you and get you on what you need because you have no idea if that TIA is going to convert to a stroke 
in an hour, in a day, or in two years. And I don't want to lose you in the meantime. So come on in and let me treat you. Can, can the TIA result in a hemorrhagic stroke? No. TIAs are symptomatic of ischemic strokes. But can they cause? No. Because there's no actual damage here. So the way we diagnose a TIA is we do MRI and CT scan. We look to see if there's damage. By definition, a TIA means you don't have damage. Okay? It was your one chance, your body going, this is coming, be prepared. Okay? <coughs> now, when we talk about stroke, it is important that you understand your risk factors. Everybody's <coughs> risk factors are a little bit different. We have our non-modifiables. This means you can't fix or change it. Okay? So these are the ones you're stuck with. Number one is your age. Your stroke risk doubles every 10 years over the age of 55. So by default, the older we get, the higher our risk of stroke. We can't fix that. Okay? The other one is family history. If you have a family history of stroke or of high cholesterol or of high blood pressure, things that cause a stroke, you're at higher risk, okay? So if there's stroke in your family, you are at higher risk for having a stroke, okay? Um, and then location, where you live, okay? So these are the death rates from stroke between 2008 and 2010. The darker the purple, the higher the rate. Anybody in here like me, a good Southern male? <laughs> Hey, it's not good if it ain't fried, right? <laughs> Hello, stroke. Yes, sir. Is the risk higher at higher altitude? That does not seem to be a factor. As a matter of fact, if you look at Colorado and Arizona and New Mexico, they're pretty good. It is almost purely cultural and primarily food. Okay? Like I said, in the South, if it ain't fried, it ain't worth it, right? Fried something and sweet tea. Yay. Right? Nevada, if you're born and raised here, you're doing okay. California is trying to jump up and join the East Coast. The South is known as the stroke belt for a good reason. I'm from Eastern North Carolina. We're known as the buckle of the stroke belt. <laughs> it's not. It's not a, a, a weather factor. It's a, it's almost purely diet. Yeah. Because look at Alaska. Oh, okay. Well, how come Alaska? Um, let's say I'm, I'm from Colorado. So, but uh, I lived in ten thousand foot, eleven thousand foot yeah. elevation. So, I mean. Oh, that's, not a, that's not a big issue. Um, some other risk factors is gender. Okay? Now this one's interesting. In each age group, men have more strokes. But overall, women have a higher volume of stroke. Why is that? Because they ignore. No. Is it the mass? They don't know if they we still live longer because stroke risk increases with age. Yeah. There's more of us at older ages, therefore our volume is higher. But in, when you look at the rate in each age group, men are, have a higher risk, but women are more likely to have one in their lifetime because we still live longer. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, going back to the Alaska question, this breaks down by race, okay? The highest rates of stroke are American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and African Americans. And with the Alaskan Natives, it's because of their diet, okay? Because of the high fat content and the fish they eat, okay? African Americans are lower than the American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Um, and then whites or Caucasians have the lowest. Hispanics are in between. 
Um, when you look at stroke data, it actually breaks down Hispanics into, they're actually a subset of the Caucasian population. So it's non-Hispanic white and Hispanic white, and then African American and others. Um, African Americans are more likely to die from their first stroke, and Hispanics are having their strokes at younger ages than, than uh, non-Hispanic white. I'm not sure, because I would think that their diet is not as bad as ours, so I don't know. I think it has more to do with under treatment with hypertension and cholesterol. Then we move into the modifiable risk factors. So this is what you need to look at and think, what can I change? Number one is high blood pressure, okay? High blood pressure is bad. It is bad for a lot of reasons. One third of adults in this country are hypertensive. One third, that's about 67 million people. Hypertensive defined as 140 and above. It depends on who you talk to. Let me, because okay. I'm coming to that. Only about one half of people with high blood pressure are properly controlled. Now, good control will cut your lifetime stroke risk in half. The question then becomes, what does that mean? What is good control? This is yet another place where neuro and cardio disagree. Okay? For a while, cardiologists had been dropping the blood pressure until they got down into the treated if it's 130. They've now gone back up, especially in older people, and said, eh, 140 really is where we need to be treating. Right now, in stroke world, we want you to be less than 120, okay? Now, that being said, if you are someone who has high blood pressure and have had high blood pressure for years, if I drop you down to 120, your brain's not gonna like that, okay? So a lot of this is personal risk factors that you have to discuss with your providers. Okay? I cannot tell you where your magic number is because I don't know your history. Everybody is different. Okay? If you've lived in the 160s and 180s and you're 70, 120 is not good for you because your kidneys and your brain are not going to tolerate it. You probably need to sit in the 140s, but that would be good control for you. Okay? Younger people who have, like my blood pressure user runs 110, 115, okay? So I need to keep my blood pressure in that under 120 range. If it started getting above 120, I probably need to think about treating it for the long term. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Again, these are conversations you need to have with your personal uh, provider, okay? High cholesterol is another one. 71 million Americans suffer from high cholesterol. Not surprising given what we eat, okay? Only one third of that is controlled. What do you think the biggest reason why people don't take care of their blood pressure and their cholesterol? Food Because they can't tell if it's... They don't feel bad, right? And especially in today's society where we don't have enough money and Medicare does not pay for your medications unless you're paying extra for the Part D. So some people have to make a decision between buying their medications and buying food, right? Well, are you gonna take the allergy medicine that makes you feel better, or are you gonna take the blood pressure medicine you can't tell if it's doing anything or not? So a lot of people choose not to take the medicine because it doesn't make them feel better. And you're right. High blood pressure, low blood pressure, it's all the same. The problem is you're gonna end up having a stroke or some other issue. Another problem is the side effects. There are a lot of side effects with the statins and with the blood pressure meds, we know that. And again, why would I take a pill that makes me feel bad when I don't feel bad when I don't take it? I get it. Um, you know, it depends, but one of the major side effects that statins have are uh, muscle aches. Muscle aches, yeah. And that just means you need to try a different one. 
There's like six different ones. So if your back ache could come. Just any muscles. Any muscle. So if you don't have a muscle, like let's say your thigh, okay? You don't have any thigh problems. You start a statin, and two weeks later, now your thighs are aching. It might be the statin. But what about connective tissue, like ligaments and tendons? What statins? I don't know. I know myalgias is a problem, which is muscle aches. I really don't know about that one. I, you would have to talk to your doctor about that. You know, pros and cons about that. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm not an expert on statins. I just put everybody on them. So honestly, you would have to talk. <laughs> I just know what I order and put you on. If you're having side effects from it, talk to your doctor. I honestly couldn't answer that. Another big, big, big risk factor is smoking. You guys know that, right? Smoking is bad. <laughs> the longer you smoke, the worse it is. I get it. A lot of people started smoking in their teens. The earlier you started, the harder it is to quit, right? But smoking is bad. You need to try to quit. The, for strokes, if you quit today, 10 years from now, your stroke risk will be the same as it would have been if you never smoked. It takes that long to fix the damage that smoking causes. Okay. Other risks, previous TIA or stroke. If you've had a stroke before, you're at higher risk for having another one. Heart disease, um, diabetes, end-stage renal. Sleep apnea is actually an independent risk factor. Even if you have no other risk factors for stroke, if you have sleep apnea, i.e. you snore at night, you are at risk for a stroke. You should probably have that checked out. So if your spouse beats you in the night, okay, saying roll over, you're snoring, you probably want to have that checked out. Um, sickle cell, physical inactivity, diet, obviously, and then obesity. So what does the brain do? Um, when we think about strokes, we have to understand that it depends on what part of the brain is affected to know what's going to happen. Okay? So the frontal lobe, which is the big part up here, this is what makes you who you are and what makes you different from me, different from you. Okay? Personality, judgment, behavior, inhibition, executive decision making, the ability to balance a checkbook or decide that you're going to pay the bills as opposed to going, eh, whatever. Okay? You're understanding that if there is a fire on the stove, you need to put it out. That kind of thing. Also, this strip right here, the motor cortex, is what puts your muscles under voluntary control. So when you decide to raise your arm, it's the motor cortex that tells your body to do it. And that's frontal lobe. Temporal lobe down here, this is speech and hearing. So this is your ability to understand words that are said to you and understand the words you are trying to say. So it's your ability to understand what I'm saying and your ability to understand what you're saying. Okay. Up here we have the parietal lobe. This is where you interpret sensation. So when you touch this table, those sensations go to that part of your brain and your brain goes, oh, well, let's see, that's hard, there's a fabric on it, that kind of thing. Hot, cold, rough, smooth. And then back here, we have the occipital lobe. That is where your brain interprets what your eyes see. Okay? Eyes, all they do is see. Your brain has to put it together and go, oh, that's a green dress. Whereas my eyes are just seeing colors and shapes. Make sense? Is that, that the left side of your brain? Is it the same or the right side? Um, so the most of it is equal, and that's a good point. The, so you have personality on both sides. You have hearing um, somewhat on both sides. But the one thing that is different is you do have a speech center. And in most of us, between 85 and 95% of us, it's on the left, okay? Which has nothing to do with personality traits. 
like they tell you in psychology and psychiatry when you took those classes. And they're like, oh, if you're logical, you're left brain. If you're creative, you're right brain. Yeah, I don't care about that crap. <laughs> what it is in my world is where is your speech center? Most of you, even the lefties, are left brain dominant because your speech center is on the left. Okay? So if you have a stroke on the left, chances are your speech will be affected. If your stroke is in the rare group, the 15% that's on the right that has speech issues, then you're right brain dominant. Okay? So my world's a little different, which you know makes sense because I do neuro. Nothing in my world makes sense. Then you also have some other structures deep in the core. You have the brainstem, you have the cerebellum, things like that. Okay? When you're thinking about blood flow to the brain, your brain actually gets about 750 mLs of blood every minute. This is a liter, this is 750. Okay, so just under a liter every minute. It's about one fifth of all of the blood your heart squeezes out with each pump. So one fifth of the blood supply is here. The rest of it goes everywhere else. The thing is, is this is a very small space for all that blood to be in. Okay. There's two pairs of arteries that go into the head. You have the carotids in the front and you have the vertebrals in the back. The carotids are the ones that people always tell you to check a pulse, right? And you see on TV and they're checking it up here. <laughs> You're like, no, no, that is not where the pulse is. So when you feel the pulse in your neck, those are your carotids, okay? In the back, you have vertebral arteries, but they enter the brain, enter the skull with the spinal cord. You can't feel those. The carotids supply the blood to most of the front part up here. So the parietal, the frontal, and a portion of the temporal. So real estate wise, pure volume, most of it is carotid. The vertebrals come in the back and supply blood to the brainstem, the cerebellum, the occipital lobe and the rest of the temporal. Is, is it okay to check your pulse? It is okay to check your pulse, yes. You're not going to hurt yourself doing that. As long as you're not jabbing yourself in the neck or someone's not hitting you with a baseball in the neck. I heard that it's uh, more likely to have plaque here and they can keep hitting it. Well, you, you don't want to tap on it, but to check the pulse is fine. You're not going to hurt yourself checking your pulse. You won't break away the plaque. No, you'd have to really tweak it to do that. Okay. So this is what it looks like. Carotid comes up most of the front of the brain. The vertebrals come up and fill in the back. Okay. When we look at what territories off of the carotid, there's a very big vessel called the middle cerebral artery or MCA. This is important because if you have a stroke in the MCA, you're going to have a lot of trouble, okay? Because this supplies a whole lot of blood to a whole lot of territory, okay? So this is the word you don't want to hear, MCA, <laughs> okay? Then we have the ACA, which is more in the middle. And then, like I said, the posterior cerebral artery is back in the back, okay? So, what are the warning signs of a stroke crystal? Okay. There's a lot of them. Strokes are not always easy to figure out if that's what's going on. Okay. When you think possibly, maybe, eh, could be a stroke, better to overcompensate and come to the ER than to ignore it and it be a big stroke. Okay. Numbness and or weakness on one side of the face, arm or leg, and this will be an acute onset. You'll be talking and your face will droop. You'll be talking and your arm will get weak, okay? And then get worse. Confusion, uh, I, I, uh, you lose the ability to understand or be able to focus on what you're doing. Trouble speaking. Trouble understanding what someone's saying to you. So you're sitting there having a conversation and all of a sudden you're uh, 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 you need to think stroke, okay? Trouble seeing out of one or both eyes. Again, this is an acute onset, 
Okay? This is not my vision's getting worse. This is I can't see. Trouble walking. Okay? Again, new onset. Walking down the street and all of a sudden this leg's dragging. That's a problem. Dizziness. Now, dizziness can be a number of things. Some of your medications may make you dizzy. But if this is a new thing you've never had before, you need to think possible stroke. Okay? Now, if you're on a lot of blood pressure medicine and you stand up and feel dizzy, it's probably your blood pressure. Okay? Sit back down, see if it goes away. But if you're walking or suddenly the world is spinning, you probably need to come let us check it out because that could indicate a brainstem problem. Okay? Loss of balance of coordination and then severe headache with no known cause. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff to remember. Okay? So the American Heart and American Stroke Association came up with a mnemoniker to help you remember it. And that's called FAST. Face weakness, arm weakness, speech, and time. F-A-S-T. Facial drooping, arm weakness or leg weakness, speech difficulty, speaking or understanding, and then time. Time is brain. What do you do? On the, the arm strength, is it both an equal arm? It's usually one, not both, but it can be both. So it's more commonly though one. But again, it's a crap, I can't move my arm, or my arm is weak, or you're holding something and you suddenly drop it. Okay? So what would you do? You're talking to your spouse and your spouse face droops. What are you going to do? Call 911. Absolutely do not put them in the car and bring them to the hospital. That is not right. You call 911. If you are driving, you pull over and call 911. Okay? Because in our system, EMS can pre-notify a stroke. They can call us before you even get here, and we're waiting on you. Okay? So you want the fastest treatment possible, therefore you want 911. Okay? If you are driving and you think you're having a stroke, you need to pull over because it could progress, and then you're going to cause an accident. You don't want to do that. Okay? Um, if you're at home and you or someone you love is having a stroke while you're waiting for EMS, please get your med list. Okay? Grab the bottles. You should all, at all times, have a current list of medications in your wallet. And you should update it every time they change. It's a pain in the butt. I have to do it for my dad. He's like, I gotta go to the doctor, I need a med list. I'm like, crap, okay. But you need that because I need to know what you take. And if you have stopped a medicine, I need to know that you're not taking it anymore because that could affect whether or not I can treat you, okay? Please look at the clock. It is 1250, whatever. My mold doesn't work correctly. <laughs> I need to know what time this started to the minute. So look at a clock. This started at 12.01. That's what I need to know. If you come home and your spouse has a facial droop and can't speak and you call 911, I still need you to tell me what time you walked out of the room. When did you last see them well? Because that will affect how I can treat them. Does that make sense? Okay. And even if your symptoms improve before EMS gets there, come to the hospital. Okay? That might be a TIA, and I need to evaluate you so we can get you on the road to not having a stroke. So what's going to happen when you come in? EMS is going to evaluate your symptoms. They're going to check your vital signs, get your med list if you have it handy. They're going to ask you what happened and ask you some brief questions about your history, pack you up and bring you in. Okay. Um, most of the hospitals in Las Vegas are primary stroke center certified. 
So you're good to go to any of them except North Vista. It's the only one that's not, okay? So wherever you're closest to is where you wanna go. Of course, I would love for you all to come to Spring Valley, but you need to go where you're closest to, okay? In the ER, you will get a stat head CT because before we can make a decision about treating you, we have to make sure you're not bleeding because that is the biggest contraindication to treating you for an ischemic stroke is if you have a hemorrhagic. So the first thing is you get a head CT. You will be evaluated by the docs in the ER. What's going on? Tell me what happened. What, do, what can you do? Move your arms, try to talk, stick out your tongue, all kinds of things. You're gonna be so annoyed with doing the neurocalisthenics. They're gonna be like, shoot me now. <laughs> Okay, don't be mad at us. We have to do this to see how you're doing. Neuro will either be contacted by phone or will be in the building and you'll have what we call an NIH, which is a stroke evaluation. Okay. Blood work will be done. Then we're gonna say, can we give you TPA? TPA is the drug that we give to bust up the clot. Okay, because most of these strokes are clots. Remember, 87%. So once the CT shows us no bleed, we're gonna try to give you TPA. You cannot get TPA if you wait too long to come to the hospital. We have a window and it's three hours from the start of your symptoms, okay? Occasionally we can expand it to four and a half, but only in special circumstances. You have got to come to the hospital. Now, if you wake up with your stroke, okay? Went to bed at 10 o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, you wake up, oh, my face is drooping. Please come to the hospital, okay? Because your stroke may have happened five minutes before you woke up. I have a test I can do to tell that. You may still get TPA, okay? But I cannot treat you if you do not come in. If you have a bleed, you will not get TPA. If you've recently had major surgery, for instance, you just went home from a cabbage, a heart surgery, something like that, I may not be able to give you TPA. However, some of our facilities, Spring Valley, Valley, UMC, Sunrise, and St. Rose Siena, have the ability to go in and pull the clot out, okay? So even if I can't give you TPA because you'll bleed, we may be able to take you to Angio and pull the clot out. Again, there's a time limit on this. You have to come to the hospital. So if you go to, for instance, uh, Summerlands, one of our Valley Health System, and they think you're having a major stroke, but they can't give you TPA, they're gonna send you to me so that we can pull the clot out. Why couldn't they give you TPA? Because you'll bleed. Because TPA is a clot buster. So if you've just had surgery, like for instance with a heart surgery, wherever they operated, you form clots so you're not still actively bleeding. If I give you a clot buster, you're gonna bleed. I can't give you a drug that will cause you to bleed. Does that make sense? Have you, uh, you have a bleed. If you've ever had a bleed. No, no, you have a bleed right now. That's why we do the head CT. Yes, sir. This uh, sense of taking a baby aspirin, maybe 81 milligrams, uh, you wouldn't do that? No, no. no. If, you, if you think you're having a stroke, you do not take an aspirin, okay? Because you don't know if you're bleeding. I need to run a test to see if you're bleeding. Now, once you've come to the hospital, and if you get your TPA or not, once you're 24 hours out from that, then I will give you aspirin. But a heart attack and a stroke are different. I know with heart attacks, they tell you to take an aspirin. I recommend you wait until the doctor tells you to do it. Please do not take an aspirin thinking that is gonna make your stroke better. Okay, because if you're again, if you're bleeding, you've just made it worse. Um, now, some blood thinners like Coumadin, Warfarin, we may be able to give you TPA on because if your number, if your INR is low, I should be able to give you TPA, or I can correct it and give it to you. The new ones, the Zeralto, the Eliquis, and the Pradaxa, right now, they don't know. 
So it depends on who your neurologist is. The neurologist I work with will probably give it to you, depending on when you took it. But here's the thing. This TPA is a clot buster. If you are on Xeralto, Pradax, or Eliquis, you probably don't have a clot stroke, something that TPA would fix, okay? Or those drugs aren't working for you, so TPA would still be beneficial. So it depends on the situation, okay? But I need to know you're on these drugs. And then, of course, if you're not actually having a stroke, probably not going to give you TPA. <laughs> Although there's times when we think someone's having a stroke and we give them TPA and it turns out they weren't, but that's okay because the complication rate from TPA is very low and I would rather give you TPA than not. I want to treat you. I want to make you better. You've got to come to me. I can't come to you. Okay. Um, while you're in the ER, they're probably going to put one to two IVs in. They're going to give you a push of the TPA and then run the rest in over an hour. You're going to have your vital signs checked a lot. Every 15 minutes for two hours, every 30 minutes for six hours, and an hourly after that. You're going to have your neuro exam checked the same amount. So you're going to be really tired of answering, yes, I know my name. My name is Crystal Kaufman. Today is Wednesday. It is 2016. <laughs> I, I get it, okay? It's annoying, but we have to make sure you're not having a complication, okay? And then you will definitely be admitted to the ICU overnight. You're gonna get a lot of tests if you come in for a stroke. We're gonna do CAT scans, MRIs, echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of your heart. We're gonna look at your carotids. We're gonna check your um, lipid panels, your cholesterol levels. We're gonna monitor your heart and look for AFib. We're gonna try to figure out why you had the stroke so that we can treat you appropriately, okay? You're gonna have a swallow a bowel. We're gonna make sure you're swallowing okay before we give you anything to eat or drink. And then PTOT, you're gonna have therapy evaluations. Well, why uh, they check your swallow? Because most people who've had a stroke have trouble swallowing. So we check everybody. You're probably going to end up on aspirin. If you have had a stroke and have never been on aspirin, you're going to be on aspirin. If you were on aspirin when you had your stroke, you're going to go to Plavix. If you were on Plavix when you had your stroke, now you're on an anticoagulant. If you have AFib, you're going to be on an anticoagulant. Okay? You're going to be on a cholesterol medicine. Even if your cholesterol is okay, I'm going to give you a cholesterol medicine, okay? And then we're going to control your blood pressure. But these don't apply to hemorrhagic strokes. They don't. You're right. These are ischemic strokes. Now, blood pressure, yes. Again, biggest risk of a hemorrhagic stroke, high blood pressure. So we're going to control you, get you under control. Best case scenario, you have a stroke, you come to me. I treat you, you walk out of the hospital fine. That is a good day. Okay? That is what I want to happen. What's, what's the probability of recidivism in a stroke? It's not recidivism. Um, how many people will have another one? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. 130,000. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That statistic I gave you earlier. I haven't percentaged it. A lot of it depends on what caused your stroke. Again, if you don't fix what caused it, you're gonna have another one, okay? The problem is, is that strokes can kill you. It is still the fifth leading cause of death in this country. It is still killing 130,000 people a year. I do not want this to happen. And the biggest reason why this occurs is if you wait to come see me, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, and that's, you know, I have to say, and he, he makes a good point, what's worse is the disability. So, and that's something you and your family need to discuss. What is a worst case scenario for you to be unable to communicate in a nursing home or to die from your stroke or whatever it is that happens? 
So that's something you probably need to talk about with your families now. So that when you're in my ICU and you've had a massive bleed or whatever, and I go, what would your mother want? They need to know, because I don't. You all seem like very nice people to me, but I don't know you all. Your families do. Share your decision, okay? Don't make them struggle. What can you do? Please go see your doctors or nurse practitioners or PAs, whoever you see, okay? See them regularly. If they say, I want to see you in three months, go back in three months, okay? They don't do that for fun. They do that because they need to see how you're doing. How are you responding, okay? Please take your medications as instructed. If your medications are giving you side effects you can't stand, call them. Hey, I can't take this drug. It's making me dizzy. It's making me nauseated. Whatever it is, it's got sexual side effects I don't like. Good for you. Call your doctor, okay? Call them and say, you got to find another one. Because I don't know you're not taking it if you don't tell me. Know your numbers. Know your blood pressure. Know your cholesterol. Know your blood sugars. Are you diabetic? Are you pre-diabetic? What's your hemoglobin A1C? Is your blood pressure in a good range? Are you sitting at 150 and you really need to be 130? Okay. And when I'm talking about your blood pressure, I'm not just saying check your blood pressure once a day when you wake up in the morning. Okay. Sometimes check it at lunch. Sometimes check it in the afternoon. Sometimes check it at bedtime. Write it down. Because if I've got you on a once a day pill and your blood pressures are great in the morning, that's awesome. But if they're spiking at bedtime, that's a problem. And I need to put you on a different medicine that has a different time of effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But if you're not checking it, I don't know that you're not controlled. Be active, be as active as you can. Coming to things like this is awesome. I am so happy to see so many of you here because you know what? You're out of the house. Good for you. Just the fact you got in the car and you came here today, that is active. You are an active, engaged person in the community. Yay you, keep it up. Next time, drag another friend. You need to get out the house, come on, okay? And also, above and beyond it all, if you or someone you know care about love, even to someone you don't like, looks like they're having a stroke, what are you gonna do? You're gonna call 911, okay? Do not wait. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. How does trans-global amnesia fit into this stroke? Hmm. So some strokes can cause amnesia. Depends on what part of the brain they hit. But honestly, I'm not sure what transglobal amnesia is. I am not a memory um, expert. You would think I'm neuro, so I should know it all, but oh my God, neuro is complicated. Um, I know my little piece of it. That's not something I'm familiar with, so I don't know. Yes, ma'am? Does it present differently in women versus men? Really and truly, it doesn't. So this is one of those few things that we can go, it's the same for everybody. There's no atypical, well there are atypical strokes, but men or women can have them. It is a bigger deal where the stroke is hitting than it is whether you're male or female. So if the stroke is hitting in the left MCA, for instance, you are going to have trouble speaking. You're not going to be able to understand anything. The right side of your body will be weak because the left brain controls the right side. Right brain controls the left side. You will probably have a facial droop, um, and uh, you're probably gonna look one direction and not be able to look the other. It's called a gaze deviation. That's what we look for. Not, and it's, it, it's not a male-female thing. It is purely what part of your brain is getting hit from this. Okay. This drooping you know, goes away. Maybe or maybe not, not always. Um, if, especially if you don't come in and get treated, you may permanently have a facial droop. 
I can't promise you that. And even if I can treat you with the TPA, for instance, you come in in 30 minutes from onset of symptoms, I give you TPA, I can't promise you I'm gonna make all of your symptoms go away. So remember I told you we have the score, it's called the NIH, National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale. That can go up into the 30s. Is this Zero is you and I right now, okay. It can go up into the 30s. If you come in with a stroke that's a 20, I may get you back to a 10, which means you have pretty significant deficits, but it's a whole lot better than the 20 was. Right. Now, I have had patients with NIHs in the 20s who came in quickly, I, they got TPA, and they walked out at a zero. So it is possible. Is part of that Bell's palsy? Uh, Bell's palsy looks like a stroke, but isn't. So that's one of those things that we wouldn't give you TPA for because you're not actually having a stroke. But it's the same facial features with the facial droop. Um, it's just caused by a different nerve problem. Does it have the same symptoms as a stroke? It, it does. It looks, Bell's palsy looks just like a stroke in the face, um, but you're not going to have the weakness of the extremity that you would with a stroke. It comes on all at once? Uh, it can. It can be slow. It depends on what's causing it. So. Yes, sir? You talked about busting up the clot. Mm -hmm. When you bust up the clot, I imagine it's in an artery, right? Yes, sir. So when it goes towards the capillaries, do we stand a chance of having small blockages in that area? So, uh, yes, and that's a very good question. So it depends on how we're breaking up the clot. So if we're doing it with TPA, what it's doing is dissolving the clot. Oh. I call it a clot buster. It's not going boom. It's actually dissolving it, okay? okay? Um, if we go in and pull the clot out, which is called a thrombectomy, they actually um, use a device, pass the clot, so they put the catheter in, pass the clot, and blow up a balloon, and then suck the clot out. That way pieces don't break off and go downstream, okay? Um, now, I will tell you that TPA does come with a risk of bleeding, okay? So if we, sometimes we'll give you TPA and it may make you bleed, okay? That usually only happens in very large strokes, which tend to bleed anyway, okay? It, I can give TPA to 100 normal brains and no one will bleed. But if I give TPA to an abnormal brain, i.e. someone having a stroke, there is a small percentage of risk of bleeding. But again, you have to weigh that versus you're having a stroke that's going to cause permanent disability. Let me try this and you may bleed. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's one of those, and that's why we, unless you can't talk to me, I give you the option. Do you want the TPA or not? But the risk of bleeding is like 5%. And again, that's in massive strokes that were going to be very debilitating anyway. Very rarely does a stroke cause you to be, I mean a bleed, a TPA bleed, cause you to be worse than you would have been if I hadn't have done anything. So I, I see it as, let me try. I can make you better. Um, very rarely do I make you worse. What's, what's the recovery time on a, a hemorrhagic stroke versus a... Um, well, it depends on if I treat you. So if, I, if you're an ischemic stroke and we treat you and you do well, recovery is a couple of days. If you're an ischemic stroke and we treat you and you don't recover or else we can't treat you, recovery is years. Um, you'll be in the hospital, you know, up a week or so, depending on if you're breathing and things like that. It's hard to say. A hemorrhagic stroke really depends on how big it is. If it's a small stroke, your recovery is pretty quick. If it's a big stroke, your recovery is going to take longer. So I can't answer that because there are way too many variables. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, anybody else?